Today's episode of Recovery Survey is fueled by Brainwash Coffee Company. I'm sure you've heard that drug and alcohol use is on the rise, especially during the pandemic. And Brainwash Coffee Company is working to raise money and awareness to support people seeking help. They donate 50% of their profits and their mission is to give back to the amazing recovery community. Their why is bold and their coffee is fresh. So if you want to sip on an amazing brew that warms your mind, body, and soul, then visit brainwashcoffeeco.com and use promo code recovery survey at checkout to get $5 off your first order. Brainwash Coffee Company, simple coffee for complicated people. You're listening to Recovery Survey, the podcast that shatters stigmas around different types of addictions and takes a deep dive into spiritual principles. First time I drank, it was ever clear. There was a full bar <laughs> and I had, and I was like, let's see what that shit tastes like. I heard that's like the really like that's what's the strongest shit in here. Let's taste that. Like, that's just the way I am. So I don't do nothing half-assed and luckily for me uh, when you're in this life of recovery right and you start trying to live a principled life that's good that's a good quality to have i'm just because i'm channeling it into better things my guest today is named jason rudine he is a person in long-term recovery and he is a co-host on the way out podcast welcome to the show jason How's it going, guys? This is Jason Rudine. I am the co-host of the Way Out podcast and a person in long-term recovery. And what that means for me is I haven't felt the desire to pick up a drink or a drug since my birthday, July 23rd, 2016. I'm grateful for this life. You know, I never thought that I would ever, like, who would want to live sober, right? Like, that sounds like it would suck balls, but it didn't. Uh, I found out that there's a lot to learn and a lot of areas in my life that I needed to grow. And I've been blessed to be able to do so and uh, meet a lot of really awesome people and hear some great stories along the way, including Brett, who I haven't had you on my show yet, sir, but I'm really happy to be here on the recovery survey. And if this was in video, you guys would be like, hell yeah, that's cool. Cause I'm rocking his shirt, his recovery survey <laughs> shirt. <laughs> Awesome, man. Well, I'm glad to have you on. Uh, we, we first met doing the live show over on recovery revolution and man, we hit it off and I was like, man, I got to get Jason on my show. I love your message. I just, I love everything about you, man. I love seeing your posts on social media. Your comments are always encouraging. Like you're just an awesome guy. And I'm so glad to have you on the show today, man. Oh, thank you, man. Thank you. You're, you're too kind. <laughs> <laughs> so if you wouldn't mind for the listeners that aren't familiar with you or the way out podcast, maybe you could kind of give us, uh, like the elevator pitch version of like what active addiction was like, what your life looked like. Um, and if they want more information on that whole period, there's also a little short YouTube, uh, video documentary style thing. I watched that a few weeks ago and that was really cool, man. Yeah, it was, dude. That oh, that's a whole story. But it was it, a guy who was in the band at the church I was attending. Um, he was a film student, and that was like he asked me if I'd be willing to do that. Uh, it was for his senior project, you know, like he had to make a film, and it had to have all these specific elements. So yeah, he did a really good job on that thing, and that was tough. That was a tough thing to go do because what you see in the video is so little compared to what, like we went to all sorts of different locations where I used to live, where I used to shoot dope, where I used to sell drugs and cop dope and all this shit, dude, and pull a lot of dirt. And it was like, man, you know, some of the stuff that I brought them and showed them and talked about to them was really hard. And a lot of that stuff didn't make it into the final product, but it was still, it was a cool experience. And my program tells me that I can't say no to stuff like that, right? Like I have to say yes, if it could potentially benefit me or somebody else, then I have to say yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, that's being of service. Yeah. It's being of service to others and, and helping carry that message of recovery. Yeah. But anyway, so elevator pitch style. 
Oh, when I was five, my mom got in like a really bad motorcycle accident and she was in the hospital for like three months in a coma and then another three months. And I had to go stay with some family members during that time. And I got molested repeatedly by my cousin when I was five at the first place I went, one of my uncle's place. And uh, I boxed that up you know, I was little. So your brain just puts it in a box so you don't think about it. And that didn't come out till I was like 12 or 13. Um, you know, mom recovered. Uh, she wasn't the same. But honestly, like for me, uh, probably because I was at such a young age, like it's like really the only version of my mom that I remember is the post accident version of my mom. But she's she's like a sweetheart now. But for, you know, when I was a kid, she was really erratic, you know, very unpredictable. She'd be elated one minute and just like going off, you know, her, she had a trip trigger, uh, anger and, and she was an alcoholic. So she was gone a lot. Uh, if she wasn't at work, she was usually at the bar and, uh, she had a couple more kids and I pretty much raised my brother and sister from the time I was eight until I was 13. My brother came around when I was eight and my sister came when I was 10. And yeah, when I was like 13, my mom got in some trouble with the law and then she had to, I, I didn't know this until I was like a year clean, dude. You know, so I was like 38, 37, something like that. And I found out that my mom had did work the program then, you know, worked 12 steps. She said it helped a lot. Well, that was kind of weird to hear because I didn't know, but needless to say, like she, she started being mom again. And then I totally at 13, you know, I capitalized on that and I took off uh, a lot running away, partying, drinking, smoking at first, uh, quickly moved into hallucinogens really quick. Like by the time I was 15, I discovered, you know, that I could front weed you know it started with weed and then i was selling shrooms and i was selling acid and then i started selling coke and then i started selling meth you know selling basically to feed my habit and uh make a little money but it was pretty much all for the habit you know i had party and keep the party going you know fucking felt like i had a sense of power being able like everybody wanted to be around me everybody wanted something from me i thought that i was like important or something it it it, it was just like it made the most sense to me to hustle if i'm gonna do this shit because it's hella expensive or it gets hella expensive especially if you like being the candy man who everybody loves because you're fucking throwing out the fatty lines and you're giving people the you know, just feeding everybody acid and like, let's just all go to another world together, you know? And that was my lifestyle, dude, was just drugs, selling drugs, doing drugs and uh, going to concerts, man, for till I was like, I don't know, 19, 20. When I was eight, when I was 17, I lost my virginity and I got uh, her pregnant. I swear to God, the first time we had sex and uh, we had my son when I was 18 and then Two years later, we had another child, a little girl. And then, you know, when my daughter was one and my son was three, the relationship dissolved. I handled it poorly. You know, I felt like it was over for months before, you know, I did anything. And then I just packed my shit and left. And I didn't say anything. There was no conversation had. I wasn't planning on leaving my kids, but that's what it turned into because I was too prideful and I couldn't. Yeah. So I left my kids and then for years that ended up becoming the thing that would fuel all my self-destructive behavior. I have, I'd started shooting up when I was 15. So I, I quick, everything I did, you know, first time I drank, it was ever clear stupid shit like that. There was a full bar <laughs> and I had, and I was like, let's see what that shit tastes like. I heard that's like the really like that's what's the strongest shit in here. Let's taste that. Like that's just the way I am. So I don't do nothing half-assed. And luckily for me, uh, when you're in this life of recovery, right, and you start trying to live a principled life, that's good. That's a good quality to have. I'm just because I'm channeling it into better things now. This life's been crazy. I've tried to kill myself a few times and I've OD'd. I don't know how many times 
I've been to jail a bunch of times. I should have went to prison for like 10 years this last go around. But thanks to the people in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and NA writing a bunch of letters on my behalf and an understanding judge who wanted, who likes a good underdog story, I got another chance. And it, that would have never worked if I wasn't really working uh, on myself in my recovery because they say that if you work the steps that it will take away the obsession, right? To use. And it, it took it away. And if it didn't, you know, cause as my track record shows, you know, two divorces under my belt, two kids I hadn't seen in 20 plus years now and all this shit that no consequence was ever great enough to make me stop. Right. So I'm, I'm grateful that it happened to be, that the stars aligned at the right time. And I did find recovery at the same time that I was facing that case. And they was able to, um, you know, because the times, the times all over my head, man, if I, if I piss dirty or if I have any like serious violations, uh, it's you're out of here, bud, you know, I'm going straight in for the full sentence. So it's not like it's not still there. It's still there right now today. I'm still, I got sentenced like 20 years probation. I'll fucking be there for like the next five years, probably still, but here I am and I'm not worried about it because I'm doing, I'm doing good in life today. And that's all thanks to God and the program people in it. That's the the abridged version, I guess. That was perfect, (laughs) man. So I'd be curious to know what was that moment for you that, that you took it serious this time? Cause you talked about the relationships you had formed in recovery and people speaking on your behalf when it came to the sentencing. So obviously you were in the program prior to, to the, to almost going to prison. So what was the moment? How did you get to that point of wanting to stop or finding, it sounds like you kind of already had a little bit of exposure to the program in the past, but what does that whole time period look like? Well, honestly, I was, you know, for the shit was really out of control from the time of my arrest. Well, it was out of control way before the arrest, honestly. But once the arrest happened, it, you know, when something like that happens and you get all your stuff confiscated from you, uh, they pretty much almost wipe out your funds too, because, you know, I had most of it on me. I didn't have like almost anything stashed at home in my safe. You know what I mean? It was all with me when I got caught. So it was like they wipe you out and all those friends or whatever I'm doing air quotes here. You know, they poof, like some kind of crackhead magic, they all disappear and you're left with nothing but your thoughts, your regrets, your self-loathing. And that was where I was at. And I, and I had a lot of toys, man, from selling, uh, and doing trades and shit. I always did trades. I had a f- few customers that were like, um, you know, kleptos or whatever. So they would come over with all sorts of shit, you know, that they stole. And, you know, I'd just be like, I love that shirt. I love those pants. I love that guitar amp or that, this, that, and the other thing. And TVs, you name it, guitars. And so I had a bunch of shit. So I was starting to just trade the shit back. You know, I traded a lot. I had a lot of money out on credit in the street. So I was getting my money, you know, getting people to hook me up uh, with either cash or dope, uh, trying to collect all that off the street. And it kept me going for a couple months of totally isolated use by myself, you know, um, sitting scared as shit. Cops are on my camped out on my road, you know, and I would like jump the fence in my mom's backyard. And yeah, mind you, I'm, I'm in my mid thirties at this time living at my mother's house because my drinking got out of hand and I destroyed my, my second marriage, you know, in 2013. So I found myself switching, giving up one crutch for another, you know, get chilling on the drinking, meeting a girl. It always starts with a girl, doesn't it? And then, uh, telling my junkie mind, telling me that I can smoke this dope one night with her and some of her friends. Cause I wanted to get laid basically and hang out longer. So I could try to do that, you know, sealing the deal that night. And, and the whole time think, telling myself that, you know, I was a banger smoking. It ain't shit, you know? And that's how it started dude. And it ended with, you know, me dumping 
I don't want to get too graphic, I guess, for you guys, but you know, a whole big bag into a ladle, breaking it all down at once, filling, you know, just sucking it all up into syringes and doing it all within like 10 minutes of itself. And then going into like the most insane psychosis, you asked about the moment, right? The moment. This was the moment, you know, it was like I went into this super insane psychosis and then it was like the most terrifying experience of my life. It was like a tailor-made version of hell just for me. And I ended up, I was going to kill myself. I was like holding a knife to my throat. I was just going to let my body fall down. And so drive this thing through my neck and I couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to do it. And that moment right there was where it was. Cause it was like, <sighs> I knew I don't want to live. I don't want to live anymore, you know, and I was pissed off, hurt, frustrated, um, scared. I was so many feelings because I couldn't do it. So I knew that I wanted to die, but I knew that I couldn't fucking kill myself. So then I was like, what do I do? You know, I finally lost. Like that was that moment where my ego was completely finally shattered. And I don't know why it took that long because trust me there's a lot of times when it, my ego should have been shattered before that guaranteed but that was it and i i called i put down the knife picked up the phone and asked for help and that he gave me guidance i followed his suggestions uh we did we made it i don't know say like about I, w I was ready to do my fifth step. I think for a while I was calling him and he stopped answering because his dad was on hospice and then his dad died and then he actually relapsed and started doing meth again. Um, so I think he's still out there running and gunning today. God bless his heart. He, he really helped save my ass, dude. But I ended up having to find another sponsor who is my current sponsor and he's he fucking took me through the rest of the way and the rest is history, man. I got involved. I got involved with this stuff, you know, service opportunities and the meetings, uh, doing the podcasts and, and everything has been a huge blessing in my life. And, and just trying to educate myself, uh, about this disease, about anything that's really, you know, in that area, even on the outer because recovery is not about just quitting, right? It's about your whole life. So there's lots of things, you know, different ways, uh, you know, the homeless populations are inextricably connected to, you know, drug addiction and so are housing and, you know, like legislative processes, you know, like harm reduction and all these different areas. So I just try to learn about everything I can, that's even related a little bit to recovery because you know, hopefully it'll give me a sense of purpose. I can, you know, find that niche that God wants me to find and get into, if that makes any sense. Um, and, and live by God's will, not my own. <laughs> Cause yeah, what I think I want is not good for me is typically the case. I still feel that, you know, like, Mm -hmm. first thought wrong for me <laughs> i need to run it through a few filters and you know if people are giving me some different feedback than what's going on in my head i need to go with that and not with what i think <laughs> i heard somebody i was listening to another recovery podcast uh yesterday and they were talking about the the sign that it had that's up in a lot of the meeting halls that says think 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 and yeah. he explained it as first because it says it three times in a row first thought wrong second thought wrong third thought maybe 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 <laughs> yes <laughs> that is freaking perfect i'd never thought about that before like that but when you were saying it it's like that makes perfect fucking sense and now i'm gonna think that every time i see that picture nice so i'd be curious to know how did you get hooked up with the way out podcast because i think if i'm not mistaken charlie was doing it solo for a little while right or, did he, or was there another co-host before you got on there no it was just charlie until I came on and then at the time when I had come on that was like episode 97 I think I'll never forget it it's the first one we recorded it was fear in recovery it was the first topic episode that the way out ever did and we did topics for the first couple of years after that 
before I think those kind of waned. Plus, I don't know if we started rising in popularity a bit too. So I think that we've been inundated with uh, guest requests as well for the last couple of years. So it's been a nonstop uh, just interview thing. And we switch back and forth now with the interviews. But at first, it was just all of us would do the topics together. And then Charles would do the interviews. And then every once in a while, Charles would invite me in to do well like the other co-host alex had quit and anyway i'm going off on like a freaking squirrel rabbit trail right now no, you're good you're good but yeah uh when i when i was first getting clean i think i had like five months clean and i went to speak at an adolescent tre treatment center out here in minnesota it's called anthony lewis center and it's just kids in there and boy there's a tough crowd that's a tough crowd to speak in front of by the way but I, was, I would do speaking engagements there from time to time. And I <clears throat> I was with my buddy, Leon, and we met up there with this woman, Tracy. I never met Tracy before this night. And this woman, so when she told her story, she was telling my story. So I related to her big time. Plus, she was really sexy. So I was like, I remember going out to the car and I said, and this is how it started. I'm not going to lie. The, male i am i'm such a typical guy but i was like telling my buddy leon i'm like she will be mine <laughs> and then so we started talking i started talking to tracy and she told me that she just did this podcast and she was like check it out she sent me the link we were just texting and you know stuff for like weeks before we ever hung out after that night, but we were talking a lot and she sent me the link and I listened to her show and it was really good. I think she's like just a few episodes before mine, like 27 or 28 or something in the catalog, Tracy B, if you want to listen to it. And she, she shared her story. And then at the end of it, he does this little, you know, in the closing segments of the show, He's like, if you want to share your story, email us at shareitwayoutcast.com and we'll get you on the calendar and you can be on the show. All are welcome, blah, blah, blah. And I felt, you know, that urging from my higher power that I should do that. Like I should, I should do that. And so I did, I emailed him, went out to his place. I think I was episode 31. Like I said, I was like five and a half months clean maybe at the time. I legit, dude, it was like, all fucking war story every horrible thing in graphic detail that's happened to me in my life so yeah if you want to hear the unabridged version of some of that shit and it's still not everything obviously right i mean we could tell stories till the cows come home there's a lot that happens in years of active addiction but you know the the low lights if you want to call them instead of highlights they were horse shit but it's all every gritty thing man Broke, I cried, you know, it was a whole thing. I was fucking ugly crying probably for part of that. And, and yeah, in like five minutes of the solution and what recovery's done for my life. <laughs> you fast forward a year and a half later, he posts something on Sober and Serious and he was like, well, I'm looking for two co hosts or one, possibly two awesome co hosts to bring on to the way out uh, to help me with the next hundred episodes. He wanted to revamp the show for episode 100, change it. All I did was commented, say what? <laughs> that's it. <laughs> I was like, that's awesome, dude. You know, at the time I was addicted to podcasts, bro. So I was like, hell yeah, that'll be cool. I was looking forward to the change in the show. And then he private messaged me and asked me if I wanted to come on and help him do it. So I was like, really? You know, I did not feel, I wanted to put that right out there. I did not feel. Like I was qualified to do that shit. Um, who wants to listen to what I have to say? And do I have anything of value to say? Like I'm the last motherfucker that people should be taking life advice from. But, you know, I talked to people about it. because so that's what my sponsor told me to do. He said, if anything comes up, you know, before you make big decisions, uh, run it through at least three trusted people, you know, in the program. Like he said, you got to run things through filters because a lot of times what they say won't match what you think. And it, it was the case. They were all like a yes, like an emphatic yes. And I was like, my fear said, no, 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 no. But yeah, he basically put it on me. Like you have to say yes, dude. So I did. And I jumped on and yeah, I think that, uh, 
I understand why Alex stopped. He was going through shit personally. He was talking about it. He was sharing his stuff, you know, just like we were. And, it, and that's what you have to do, right, Brett? I mean, we got to be real. If you're going to podcast, you better be yourself, you know, like if you're not, you're just trying to like look some type of way and you're not in it for the right reasons. I think like you're cheating yourself out of support that you can get. And, uh, yeah, I think that we both struggled with feelings of inadequacy with that at that time, you know, cause I think he was on for like, you know, it was only, I don't even know if he made it to 10 episodes, if even before he just kind of faded out, he had to focus on his shit. And that's cool, man. We love Alex. He's a good ass kid. He is a good guy. He's a good kid. He actually just got his welding license. He's a professional welder now making good money doing nice. the deal. Yeah. So, I mean, we all have our paths and, you know, sometimes I wonder how I even make this shit work, but it's nice since we switched over to the zoom thing because it's much more flexible because like my job will have me out of town. Uh, a lot, actually. I pretty much live in hotels in the warm months. So that being said, you know, I can still do recordings and whatnot. I can let my, if I have a bunk mate, you know, I can let them know, like, stay the fuck out for like an hour and a half, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and we can get this done. Cause I still need it. It feels great to be able to do this, you know, and have, have awesome talks about recovery with people who are really passionate about it when I'm in a fucking bad way, like I've been the last few days, actually, we were talking about like, this is making me feel a lot better. So. Yeah. There's something, there's something to this whole podcasting thing, man. I feel like I get more out of it than, than other people get out of it. And, and yes. that might not be true, but, but every time I do an episode, I just, there's something about getting that can making that connection with somebody else in recovery and, I don't know. I, I get a lot out of every episode. So that I feel like that's part of the reason that I keep doing it. Totally dude. I get like a natural high, mm -hmm. you know, it's like getting high and it sticks with me. Like I got, I just got God bumps like right now to, as we're talking <laughs> about this. And I think this is maybe something that we don't talk about that much, you know, but it's like, I try to like, I think when we did 150, when we hit like episode 150 or something, we did like a celebratory episode where we talked the pretty much the whole episode was just me and Charles. And we were talking about like why we do this. Mm -hmm. Right. And I was like, dude, I learn so much from all the guests and <clears throat> from Charles, dude, Charles is like awesome. I love him, you know? And it's just like, dude, without people like you, man, I can't, imagine that i would be able to have stayed clean you know but it's like just impossible not to get inspired and and when your ears are actually open bro it's like you can't help but like latch on to these nuggets of fucking wisdom you know these little pearls that people drop you know and it don't matter if you got an hour clean we could have a conversation and you could drop something that i'm like bam putting that in my pocket for later you know you take what what you like and leave the rest or what works for you, whatever they say. And I feel very blessed because this is like a way that you kind of get like, uh, what do you call it? Like special VIP access to like some of the best spiritual wisdom, mm -hmm. uh, when you're start doing this and people are, you know, you're, you're having people on that are authors and, you know, recovery musicians and and just like super intelligent counselors i've got that judge that gave me another chance i got to interview her one time just because another guy who has a tragedy to triumph uh aaron lane that's another podcast that's a recovery podcast tragedy to triumph he fucking he did that and i listened to that episode and i was like dude that's an awesome idea i should email judge street and I did, and it, God damn, if she didn't t hit me back like a week later, bro, and say she'd do it, and I was like, no fucking way. And I was obsessing all week, writing questions and thinking of, I wanted to ask like poignant shit, and it ended up being such a cool interview, like really getting to like, because I mean, I don't know about you, man, but like coming from a criminal lifestyle, 
I like thought of judges as like cr- cruel robots, you know, heartless. Mm. This this episode will humanize judges for you big time. She is so vulnerable and her candor is amazing in this episode where she just tells us what it's like to be a fucking judge, man, and a mom who's a judge and dealing with kids who are struggling with addiction and all this shit. Like she, we got deep, bro. And I'm like, yeah. You couldn't trade this shit. This is like worth so much more than the best moment being high. You know, the stuff that we get to experience and learn and and have the privilege of being able to try to apply in our lives. It's crazy. Absolutely, man. Well, we're getting kind of towards the end of our time. So I'd love to give you the opportunity to let the audience know if they're interested in the way out podcast or, or getting in contact with you. What are the best ways to find you contact you? Where can they find the show, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Well, you can find me on Facebook, Jason Rudin, two E's. R U D E E N <laughs> or on Instagram. I am a way out underscore co-host. I believe I just changed my name. It used to be fear is a liar. And I was like, I'm gonna change that shit. I got old. Uh, I also have an email address. You can email me J A S R U D E E N at gmail.com. Um, if you want to be a guest on the show, hit me up, man. And uh, we'll get you on. I'm like always down to make some new friends in recovery or, or help. Uh, we have also our website wayoutcast.com and that there you'll find uh, links to all of our, you know, our full catalog of episodes. And also we have some other resources on there, some links to some recovery merch that you could buy. You know, you could buy Whale Podcast shirt or or there's some other organizations that we're partnering with and we're still in the process of building that up. So there's not a whole lot on there right now, but you can check that out. Uh, we have a playlist on the Spotify called the Way Out Playlist. And that's the picture on it is the same as our logo. So it's like a white background, big black arrow says the Way Out Podcast on it. And it, the way out playlist is curated by our guests. Every episode we ask our guests, you know, what's a song that reminds you of your own recovery. And then they tell us, and you know, we put, I built a playlist out of it. It was pretty fun to listen to. I just want you all to know, man, there's hope, dude. And even if it don't feel like it, there's hope, there's always hope. And if you need help or support, you know, feel free to reach out to myself. I mean, I know I could speak for Brett that he says the same thing. Um, you're not in this alone. You don't have to be never alone, never again, unless you choose to be. And uh, yeah, just fucking keep on keeping on. And I hope that if you do check out the show that it, you, you know, find some benefit to it because it's, it's not something we get paid for. This is something that we do to be of service. We want the content to be free and remain free. We want it to be a, you know, a resource out there that can help. And we honor all pathways of recovery. So if you don't like the 12 steps or you're not into the God thing or whatever, it doesn't matter, man, because we've got something for you in that catalog of episodes. That's gonna, uh, you know, raise a eyebrow for you. It's going to make you want to check it out. And we always have in the show notes, all the resources that people share about, uh, we find the links online, you know, and, and we put them in the show notes, nice and easy, clickable links, man. It's like right when you're searching the episode, you just scroll down a little bit and pass the play button and they're right there for the grabbing and you can get your hands on those resources or go check out the additional um, things that they talked about. It's, it's a way to give back and it's, and it's, there's so much out there, man. You know, I mean, I, I really feel for people and I, when they feel like there's no help for them, you know, like they're a lost cause. I thought that for so many years that I was a lost cause. And if I knew then what I know now, I would have slapped myself because it's like, no dude, there's so much out there as far as resources and so many people that want to see you do good and they just want to see you win, man. And they just want to help you out and they know where you're at. They know where you're coming from. Cause they've fucking been there, man. 
So I'm going to start crying and shit. <laughs> no, that was perfect, man. That's perfect. Well, Jason, I appreciate you coming on the show today, man, and, and sharing part of your story, telling us a little bit about the podcast and kind of giving us that behind the scenes look of how you got started. And man, I just love what you guys are doing. And, and like you said, man, we're just here to, to help the next person. And like you said, we're not getting paid for this. It, it's actually costing me money to continue to have the podcast, but Yep. I love, I love being a part of, of this community, you know, both, both the recovery community and the podcast community. It's, it's just awesome to get to, to give back and to have conversations like this, man. Like it really, like you were saying, it really is like my new high. So I, I can't thank you enough for coming on today, man. I really do appreciate it. Hell yeah, man. Same here. I, I love you. I love what you're doing. I mean, you guys think Brett's, this podcast is cool. You know, it's like, he's, this ain't his only thing. He's doing recovery revolution live and he's adminning shit and he's freaking got a wife and kids and a job too. You know, it's like <laughs> we, we, we're regular ass people, dude. And we're busy yeah. lives, yep. really busy, but this is, yeah, this is the meat and potatoes, man. This is the stuff that keeps us going. So dude, I'm grateful. I need it. I need you guys. I need this. So mm. yeah. Thanks for having me, man. It's been a pleasure. Definitely, man. Anytime, anytime. Jason, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really do appreciate it. And I'm so grateful for the friendship that we've started to form. If you guys haven't already, be sure to check out the way out podcast. You've been listening to Recovery Survey. If you got anything out of today's episode, I'd ask you to please leave us a five-star review and share this episode with a friend. If you'd like to get in contact with us, you can find us at recoverysurvey.com. You can listen to all of our episodes on the website as well as connect with us on social media where you can get previews for upcoming episodes.